together and welcome back. <laughs> um, I am so pleased um, to be able to present to you um, our speaker this afternoon, Mary Lou Forward. Um, we're so excited to have her here as the new executive director of SUNY COIL. Um, at the SUNY Coil Center. Um, I, she has um, uh, co-located with her staff um, um, with uh, Open SUNY in downtown Albany, and we're just thrilled to have them nearby to be able to um, see them regularly and, and have potentials for collaboration and understanding about what's going on uh, between our two units. Um, uh, as I said, Mary Lou is the new executive director of the SUNY Coil Center. Uh, she came to us um, formerly having been the executive director of the Open Education Consortium. And I am going to turn it over to you, Mary Lou. Welcome to the summit. Welcome to New York. I, I guess you, you have been here in New York. Um, but I, I'm just so pleased to introduce you to this community and to have you tell us all about the Coil Center. All right, well, thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here, and I want to thank Alex for inviting me. And when we were talking about this, we realized we actually have several things in common, and today I realized we have one more thing in common, and that is reading glasses. <laughs> so um, forgive me as I whip them on and off my head through the presentation and try not to poke myself in the eye. Um, but anyway, this is where I was going to start today um, with some wonderful background quotes about the importance of international uh, collaboration and cross-cultural skills. And I say this is where I was going to start because I've actually decided to start somewhere else. And I wanted to, instead of jumping right into a presentation, actually give you um, background into the preparation for the presentation because I think that gives enough context to have you stick with me to the end. So um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say here today, I wanted to, uh, to convey what COIL is and why it's so important and why it's so cool. I wanted to inspire you to join us. I wanted to invite you to be part of this. I wanted to impress you. I wanted to be Abraham Lincoln. But I'm not as tall or as smart as Abraham Lincoln, so instead I prepared a presentation giving you all of the facts and all of the details about what COIL is. And then I uh, thought of something else. And yesterday on the way down, I realized this isn't really what people are going to want to hear about. And so what is it that they want to hear? And it went, took me back to uh, a comment that I heard at a conference a few years ago, just an offhand comment that someone made in the hallway. And it was one of these things that really transformed the way I listen to presentations at conferences. And if I'm smart enough to remember, hopefully the way I prepare for them in the future. Um, and you know, the thing is, when you're giving a presentation, you've all heard this, you all incorporate this. There are lots of tips and tricks, right? Tell stories, use humor, uh, not too much text, um, really engage your audience, right? And, and avoid those kind of annoying and distracting behaviors. Um, but uh, by the way, when I Googled annoying behaviors, this was the image that came up. So let that be a lesson to all you giant octopi. Um, so <laughs> let me get back to... Uh, the, the offhanded comment I heard. The offhand comment I heard was people were coming out of a presentation and they said, you know, you know why I tuned out of that? It's because everybody was telling me what and nobody was telling me so what. I wanted to ask, why should I care? So when I went back and thought about this, I thought, okay, I need to concentrate a whole lot more on the so what. Why should you join us? Why is this inspirational? Why is this exciting? So I'm asking you to bear with me with enough of the what to give us a com common vocabulary to understand what I'm talking about, and I'll get quickly to the so what, because that's really, um, I think, what's interesting to everyone. So what? Quick background on what COIL is. COIL is a collaboration between classrooms that take place online, that's hands-on, that's practical, that's jointly created, and that students get involved in projects. That is a long way of saying this infographic, which is at its base, COIL is two faculty members coming together, designing an experience for students that will take place online that is often cross-disciplinary. They do all the planning, they do everything together, and then they turn it over to the students. So then the students collaborate. They do the activity, they start creating knowledge, they co-develop, they have discussions, they learn about each other, and they come out with an outcome. Um, and it's very powerful. 
And I wanted to come back to the, the, the coil starting with faculty collaboration because this is really uh, important to us. It's faculty being equal, coming together from, say, the University of uh, Durban, or Durban University of Technology, and uh, SUNY Ulster. And they're coming together to collaborate and to create an experience for their students in very different disciplines. It's basically this, two classes coming together with one unit, and it's interactive, and it is interdisciplinary, and I'll get to some examples of that um, right now. Some of these are examples that you can see up here are COIL courses that just took place very recently. So somebody from Brockport teaching health and aging, uh, working with a, a class in Lebanon looking at technology, and they looked at well, what's the effect of technology on fitness. So it's forcing the students who are in Brockport thinking about nutrition and fitness, how is technology impacting my field? How can I talk about my field with these, this group in Lebanon who's thinking about technology in a way that makes sense and makes them care about it? And their online project is looking at this. How is technology influencing fitness? Same thing about this one I really love, the, the SUNY Delhi one in history, looking at um, how, how the evolution of the scientific method with a course, with a class um, in Cairo focusing on comparative education. So how do you find that common ground? How do faculty get together from such different disciplines and actually find something that's meaningful to both of them, that gives students a real experience, and that allows them, the students, to take the lead? And having them explore what's the history of the scientific method from your perspective, and then coming out with something together that they can present is really powerful, obviously, letting students lead. So that's what it is. Let me talk about so what. Why is this interesting to everybody? And I should say this was one of the original slides. I did have a little so what in here. Um, that so what? This is applied learning. These are all the things that SUNY cares about, right? These are high impact practices. This is uh, curricular internationalization, very cost effective. This is innovation for faculty. This is allowing students to co-create. This is great stuff, but so what? And so then I decided to go one step further back. And as educators, no matter where you sit in the educational enterprise, if you're an instructional designer, or a librarian, a faculty member, a staff member, you're always told what your role is, right? An educator's role is to blank. And you can read articles, you can listen to presentations, and they'll all tell you something different. And some of them include these. Your role is to prepare students for their careers, to make them workforce ready. Your role is to prepare students to be excellent citizens of our state and of our country. Your role is to make students curious. Your role is to make sure that they're well-rounded, that they have a lot of ideas, that they have a liberal background, that they can think and that they can do and that they can discuss and that they can engage. Great, but how do we do that? How do you, as an instructional designer or a librarian or a faculty member, actually bring those kinds of skill development avenues into a student's education? What are the tools that we can actually uh, take to make this work? Oops, move up a little bit. Um, so one of the challenges that we really have is how do we get students to connect to their studies and to each other? And so uh, I'm going to take a quick detour before I get back to that question. I want you to think a little bit about international and intercultural and how international is part of everybody's life. And what I mean by that is it's not just about work if you work in something internationally, but if you are deciding to take a trip and you want to call the airlines, you're just as likely to reach a call center in South Africa as you are in Milwaukee. So what does that mean? For most people, that's not a problem. But for some people, I'll take, for example, my uncle, who I was thinking of when I made this slide. You know, he's in his 80s. And for him, talking to someone in South Africa is stressful. It's an accent that he might not understand. He doesn't get the context. He doesn't understand why that person doesn't know his local airport code or why flying through Cincinnati is easier than Atlanta. So he gets frustrated. So he's more likely to come out of that experience being annoyed than he is to feeling satisfied. And it's not the fault of the person on the other end of the phone. It's actually, they may know their job very well, but he's uncomfortable, and that translates. So if you think about uh, things, too, think about the phones that you have in your pocket or on your desk or in your hand, and where those things come from. Where do the components actually come from? And where do the ideas for those components come from? They come from all over the world. So now you're at Apple, and you're thinking about, uh, or maybe you're in banking, or maybe you're in design, and you have to think of clients and colleagues 
um, and friends and vendors and suppliers all over the world. And you have to interact with them. And you have to interact with them effectively by knowing what they don't know and translating it into a way that they can understand and making sure that you can understand their context so that you have a good relationship. So how do we do this? I'm going to switch gears one more time and ask you to bear with me. Um, so many years back, I was the Dean of African Studies. And I had a wonderful colleague in Ghana, Nana Fokajimang, who was a professor at the University of Cape Coast. And she came to visit us. My son was two. And I thought, you know, one of the things that really frustrates me in African studies is that the United States knows so little about that continent. And it's largely ignored and often really misrepresented. And so what can I do to change that? And I said, well, let me ask Nana if she'll go to the classroom with me, if she'll go to my son's classroom and talk to the students about Ghana. And she, her background is in English literature. And so she had done a ton of research on Akan folktales. And so she said, sure, she would come in and tell stories about Anansi. And she did that, and the students loved it. And at the end, she said, any questions? And one little kid raises his hand, and he says, are there trees in Africa? <laughs> and then the next question was, what do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> and then my son, Spider-Man, raises his hand. And I thought, oh, good. At last, there will be a well-informed question from a second grader. <laughs> and he said, do kids go to school there, too? <laughs> so now. Of course, Nana is an extremely accomplished academic. She went on the next year to become the head of the University of Cape Coast and eventually the Minister of Education for Ghana. Um, so I was embarrassed. I thought, you know, hmm, they're second graders. But then I thought about it and said, you know what? Actually, I'm so glad they had that opportunity. And I'm so glad they asked those questions because those were the questions that they cared about. They were trying to envision themselves. What if I'm in Ghana? What am I going to have for breakfast? Am I going to school? What does my environment look like? These are real questions. They were engaged. They were curious. And, uh, and they felt like it was OK to ask. So fast forward that. What if those students had been out of school? What if they were adults? And what if they were working? And they now have to talk to people in Ghana for their work. And they don't know the context. And they don't have the tools to be able to ask questions that are appropriate. And even though they might be curious, they might be hesitant to ask. Or they might take the route that my uncle took and be frustrated and be angry <coughs> and wonder why they have to do this. So because the world is so interconnected and we're not going backwards with globalization, shouldn't we be giving the tools to these students to be able to deal with intercultural situations effectively? No matter where they are in the world, they have friends, they have families, they have colleagues that they have to talk with, that they have to work with, that they have to interact with. Isn't that part of our responsibility as educators? An educator's role is to provide skills that allow people to deal with diversity and intercultural issues? I think it is. So let me tie this back to COIL. <laughs> so uh, COIL is that interactive classroom that gives people the space to ask the questions, to experiment, and to have real interactions on a project in real time where it counts, but it doesn't count that much. It counts enough for them to be able to develop those skills without having, say, uh, an offensive situation at work that could cost them their job. This is a, a place for them to, to experiment and to develop. Um, so I wanted to, to, to go back and talk about how do we get those questions. Like, I'm on the phone now to Ghana. I've never been there. I'm wondering, are there trees, or does it look like the Lion King? Um, and how do we get students to ask those questions now that they're 20 and not in second grade? <laughs> The way that we do that is in the COIL development model, the initial part is icebreaker. It is socialization. It is trust building. And so this is from the um, university in Amsterdam that works with us. And they have come up with a, a whole list of socialization options. One I wanted to talk about was from Monroe Community College. And when I visited MCC in September, they showed me this great video that they had done for COIL class. And they had just told their students, make a video of your everyday life and post it and introduce yourself to your partners that are overseas. And in this case, it was Mexico. And the students had taken their video, and they had walked around just with their smartphone. This is my campus. This is my building. This is my car. Here's my roommate. There's my dog. This is where I eat dinner. And they asked the students in Mexico to do the same thing. Tell me about your daily life. Those are the questions that establish trust. Those are the questions that say, we have enough commonality 
that we can come together and work on this project together. So it's really important that they do that. And by the way, that's the cross-cultural skill building that they really need. And the faculty can help um, give them the feedback that they need. So we ask students, of course, what do you get out of this? Once you've had this experience, is this really working for you? Are we really uh, helping you develop those skills that we want you to develop? And here are some of the quotes that we get from students. Um, they say, yeah, it, op it opens the world for me. It shrinks the globe. It makes it possible for me to go overseas. It, it makes me feel like I have friends in other places. So this is working. This is giving them some personal. But what about academic? So we have some academic skills, too. And they say, yeah, you know, I've learned how to work in a multicultural team. I've learned how to do team building online. I've learned how to kind of take the lead on this project and run with it. Uh, there's benefits to faculty, too. One of them, of course, is that you get exposed to other people. You make these connections. You make linkages that could lead into research or other kinds of things. The other thing is it makes you think, like, how do you apply your discipline in another place, in another culture, or in another discipline? Um, but it also introduces you to different teaching styles and different teaching techniques. And this is a more of an official survey that was done again by Amsterdam. And you can see here that students are saying, yeah, this really made me I uh, feel like I had some cross-cultural skills. I have the confidence now to deal with people from different cultures. I have the curiosity to want to do that. Um, I feel like I can, I can be successful. And I also have skills that I can take with me into the workplace. I've got some online skills. I've got some team building skills. Um, so again, this is the typical course model. The introduction, secondary is, is lightweight, we would say, a lightweight project. Comparison, what's going on there, what's going on here. Here's how we look at marketing. Here's how you look at marketing, for example. And then it's a collaborative project. This is where the students create. This is where it's really important that we have the tools and the design necessary for them to do something meaningful. Because we don't want a disposable assignment. We don't want them to throw this experience away. We want it to mean something to them. We want them to be able to come out and be proud of the fact that they've done this great work. And then they have to conclude it, wrap it up, and present it. Um, so where I think you guys come in a lot is as the experts on, on online pedagogy are, there's a lot of design decisions that go into making these courses. So one of the design decisions is uh, how long is this going to be? What part of the course is this going to play? Is it the whole course? Is it a module? Is it, uh, it going to replace something? Is it going to be brand new? Another design decision is the mode of collaboration. Is it going to be synchronous, asynchronous? Are we going to do something where we might be able to bring a faculty member or some students overseas during the class to, to be part of this? What's the, what's the possibilities? And then, of course, the last decision is technology and the technology and service of what the faculty members are trying to do. What are the tools? What are they comfortable with? We don't, uh, we don't prescribe any platform. If they want to use Facebook, great. We've seen extremely successful Facebook courses. If they want to use um, their LMS, fine. That's also great. If they want to use Google Docs, perfect. Zoom, excellent. Whatever they're comfortable with and whatever serves their purpose. So all those design decisions, I wanted to just highlight a couple because I think it really allows faculty to be innovative and also designers to be really innovative. So this is a course that took place between uh, um, Genesee Community College and a uh, forensics class in Turkey. And the, the course at GCC was photography. So how do you get photography and forensics to find a common ground? What they did was they said, let's have the photography students learn how to film a crime scene. And so they developed scenarios for crimes. They had the students stage that and photograph it. They sent it to Turkey. Turkey analyzed it and said, well, actually, we needed this kind of resolution or this kind of angle or this kind of lighting. They restaged it, and then they had to present it to the other groups in the class for feedback. And so here's a place where they get to apply their knowledge in different ways. How many photography students who sign up for a photography class are going to think about forensic photography? Not that many. Now they do. Now they think about this as a viable career. Um, and same with the forensic students. How many of them were actually thinking about the person behind the camera who's collecting that uh, data that they need to be able to prosecute or to, to develop a case? And if they make a mistake, wouldn't you rather have them make it in the classroom than in a real case? Now they have some experience with this. Another one I wanted to talk about, because this is more about the design of the course than it is the content. This is a course between Mexico uh, and the US business class. This is SUNY Ulster with the uh, University of Sonora. Um, uh, sorry, Nor La Salle Nor Nordeste. And they uh, work together um, by making their class into a mini business. And so the professors act as the board of directors. 
they appoint a CEO from each class, and then they appoint project team leaders from each unit that's working on a collaborative project. And if there's an issue in the class, the students have to go to the team leader first, the team leader goes to the CEO, and if necessary, the CEO goes to the board. So the professors are fairly hands-off in this. And what they're trying to do is to teach the students about corporate culture, about different roles, about how do you get things done, uh, about chains of command, and about how you interact with other people within your company. And they do this very successfully to the point where this is a quote from a student saying he wasn't even in business and marketing. He did this COIL class, switched his major, and now he applied for a job um, at the local U-Haul, was assistant manager, and based on the skills that he developed, is now the manager. So this is great that he's out of, you know, what, a year and a half out of college, and he credits this experience for allowing him to be successful. So I wanted to say, okay, now hopefully you're interested. Hopefully this is exciting to you. Hopefully you're thinking about design choices that you might make if you had a COIL course. Now what? This is the SUNY COIL network. These are the universities and colleges that are part of what we do. We offer support to universities and colleges to make this happen. Um, if, you see your, if you see your institution on this list and you're not involved in COIL, please reach out, find out who the COIL coordinator is. We can help you do that. Um, find out how you can support them. Find out how you can get involved. If you are involved, please tell other people about it. Use examples. Talk about how this, this really helps fit into all kinds of different goals that your institutions are trying to do. And if your university or institution is not on here, um, give us a call. We'll try to help you get it started on your campus. So I wanted to thank you very much for your attention. Does anyone have any questions for Mary Lou? Mary Lou, how do Lou? students oh. know about COIL courses, or like how do they know if they're signing up for them? Um, it depends on the campus right now. That's one of the things that we need to kind of build into what we're doing is also tracking the courses. You had amazing statistics that we were salivating over this morning. Um, <laughs> that we, it, it depends on the campus how they do that. Some, some market in the catalog, some put out a list, some have a website, um, some it's a surprise. Yeah. So it really depends and That's we're trying to thought figure out the best way. <laughs> you know, there, there are arguments for and against that. You don't want to surprise students. On the other hand, some students who would see that they had this as a component might not want to take the class. So right. how do we handle that in a way that we can explain to the students what this opportunity actually represents and not just turn them off immediately? Right. Oh, sorry. How do the faculty connect from one country to another? And is that something that you facilitate through your office, or do individual faculties have personal relationships? Or how do they make that connection to mm -hmm. offer these courses? Yes. <laughs> so, yes, exactly what you said. We can help facilitate that. We have a network of global partner institutions um, that we can help match people with. Um, and there are also faculty development courses that actually intentionally put people together. Um, but if you have a relationship or a colleague has a relationship and you want to coil with that person, that's also fine. Um, it, and I think the, the benefit to going through the COIL Center is that you really get that cross-disciplinary uh, element into it, whereas a lot of faculty have colleagues who are in their same discipline overseas. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly valid COIL approach, but if you're looking for uh, some of those more creative ones, interdisciplinary, then we can help out with that. Yeah. Mary Lou, as I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking about OER, ed Open Educational Resources, and so is there a connectivity between COIL and uh, the production of new content and collaboration? Um, it's actually one of the things that really excited me about coming to COIL because I think as, um, as Alex mentioned, the, my prior eight years was heading the Open Education Consortium. So it was really working in open education, looking at open pedagogy, thinking about OER uh, and its evolution. So um, there's so much room for that within COIL. To, to make sure that the, the things that are produced are openly licensed and available to other people to bring into their curriculum if they can't do a COIL course, for example. Case study, best practices, all of that stuff. Um, and, and one of the courses that was really interesting to me was actually an artificial intelligence course with an English composition course in the US, and uh, I think it was MCC. 
And they actually came up uh, together to write a newsletter about what artificial intelligence means to you. So they had to translate not only through cross-cultural lenses, but the content of people who are living and breathing artificial intelligence into a way that students could understand why it's important, why it has impact on their lives. And then they made a newsletter and distributed throughout their campus. That's something that should be openly licensed, absolutely, and available to other campuses. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm, I'm using the time that you gave to explain that the time was more than maybe three or four or five courses that were actually combined together in the COIL course. So there have been experiments with multiple COIL courses. Um, I can go back to my previous experience, because again, I, I actually only started at SUNY um, like three days before the chancellor did, so my knowledge of COIL history is not as deep as other people in this room. But um, when I was at SIT with African Studies, we actually did something similar where we had five universities um, from different countries collaborating to look at migration and the effects of migration and the implications of migration, uh, in this case through from West Africa through to Europe, but also what that those corollaries would be uh, in the United States, for example, migrant farm workers, and develop that. And this was, this was before OER, before I knew about OER, but we tried to make that an openly licensed resource. So again, kind of getting back to my motivation for being here, I think this is a great culmination. And where I'd like to see us go is um, you know, to, to theme things. So why don't we have coil, multiple coil courses, for example, looking at um, looking at the environment, looking at climate change, and then having those resources become something that anyone can draw upon. Mm -hmm. Mary Lou, what does, your, what does the COIL office do and how do they support individual campuses? Um, so we offer right now a lot of professional development opportunities for faculty who are interested in coiling. So you can learn about COIL, how to do it, be matched with a partner, and then we give the support to actually develop uh, the course together. Um, we noticed that it works really well if that's more of a team approach, say with library and with uh, instructional design. That works much better to have that happen. Um, and then we provide information on, on best practices. Now, we're planning on making that much more uh, visible, much more available. So we really want to, to get out all this experience that people have had over the last 10 years with COIL and have that available as, uh, as starting points for, for people and provide just-in-time support. We are, we're not there yet, but we're hoping to get there within the next year or so. Thank you. I see that there's a student teamwork um, in between two different campuses or two different uh, schools. How does the professor or the, uh, assess the student work equally because they are performing different? Yes, yeah, so um, that's good. Thank you for that question. Because the, one of the important things is that it's not that the professors assign one grade to the group and that that counts for both classes. It's that however the COIL course fits within the class of the professor, they're going to evaluate it according to their class standards. So you have to participate equally, and you may have a participation grade that counts for both classes, for example. But if you're teaching artificial intelligence and someone else is teaching English, the AI professor is not going to evaluate the students based on their English writing. And neither is the uh, English professor going to, to base it on the student's technology skills. So those evaluations are, are appropriate to the classes in which they live. Thank you. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I know you're talking about um, international cooperation, but I'm just thinking of how nicely this could work between SUNYs. Absolutely. And between different disciplines within the same institution. <laughs> because often, you know, some disciplines think that other disciplines speak entirely different languages. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, that was just really more a comment than a question. Well, go for it. <laughs> we're, we're happy to have, uh, you know, this pedagogy obviously isn't limited to what we're talking about. It can be used in multiple ways, including, uh, you know, intercultural interactions within the United States. There's a lot of good that could be done from these kinds of uh, interactions. Um, that's not where we are at the moment. I'm not saying that's not where we might be sometime in the future, but... But yeah. we could use the, the argument that, well, listen, we're making this work with 
courses that are in different countries, why can't we make it work within the same state where everyone speaks the same language? So. Any other questions, Mary Lou? Mary Lou, I was just thinking, um, are there any enrollment and tuition issues? Uh, so the students are enrolled in their home campus and the, the class that they're enrolled in, they're paying tuition to that class. There's no fee to do this. So there's no add-on if a student wants, if a student is in a COIL course at either campus. The students in Lebanon are paying their Lebanese tuition. The students in, at MCC are paying that tuition. And, and the credits come from And the credits come from campuses. their home campus, yeah. Are any of the courses full courses or are they modules within courses? Most of them are modules. Some do collaboration throughout the semester. But it's not necessarily that it's a team taught course 100%, That's but right. rather that there is an activity that is going through the entire course um, throughout the semester. And the professors are also adding content that they think are appropriate for the learning outcomes on, on around that activity. Okay. Yeah. Anything else for Mary Lou? Just one quick. How are language differences handled? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's part of it, right? So um, uh, anyone who's traveled, you know, language is huge. And if you uh, don't speak the language well, it can be difficult to communicate. But it's also important for people to, uh, to have that opportunity within an academic setting to, to develop the skills of patience and support and other kinds of things for different languages. Um, and that's true for the US students, and it's true for the students who are collaborating from overseas. Most of these collaborations happen in English. Not all of them, but most of them do. Um, and that has to be taken into account when you set the activity. So are you setting an activity that's actually appropriate to the level of language ability of the students? We also have COIL happening across language learning classes, so Spanish classes frequently in the United States with classes in Mexico, um, and, and that consideration is just as strong. So how, how do we make sure that the activity that's being designed in the US is appropriate to the language level of that class? Um, and there's also time difference. So I mentioned Cairo and, and Lebanon and other places. Uh, you know, sometimes um, a lot of the activities are happening on uh, or, or not within the classroom time. So some of them are happening on WhatsApp and they're happening when students have the opportunity. A lot of it's asynchronous and then they try to figure out times one or two or three times during the semester where they can do something live. So I just thought of another thing I wanted to ask you. Um, one of the things that we, uh, another of the things that we have in common is an interest in cross-cultural communication. And I'm wondering about the faculty development that you provide mm -hmm. and specific to cross-cultural communication and if there are um, generic faculty development activities that you do across the board with everybody and what those look like. So there are. Um, one of the things, as you know, Kim said, we're talking a lot about how we can collaborate better with the Open SUNY. So one of the one of the things with our training right now is it is a little bit of one size fits all. So we have cross cultural communication, we have online learning, uh, we have pedagogical considerations for for Coil all within one course. Some faculty don't need one; they need the other. Um, so we do have activities that we present to all faculty about um, you know making space, talking to students about patience. Um, talking to students about behavior and offensive behavior and all of those um, kinds of things that are that are embedded in the course development course. Some faculty don't need that. Some faculty have enough international background that they that that's not interesting to them. So we're trying to pull those things out into separate units and make it uh, kind of a chain that people can go through depending on their backgrounds. Okay. Anybody else? Great, this right, was very you. good. Thank you so much. <laughs>
remind everybody here that we're collecting stories, um, case studies on the implementation of OSCAR as a course review process. Catherine, I see you. You need to be interviewed, too. Um, so it's uh, 2.49. We can't do everybody between now and, and uh, uh, 3.30 when the next presentation will begin. Uh, but I'd like to get some folks in. So we're going to have a networking break right now. They have some beautiful, I just saw them, beautiful little treats out there for us. I know we're probably still full from lunch, but they look great. Um, so let's do some networking and come back at 3.30 for the next um, um, presentation. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thanks, everybody. I know she's the one that's prepared the other one.